Hi, welcome to the Ask Me Anything Learning Sysma session. With me, Adam Thomas, I am your host for today. And we're going to talk about stuff like what I've learned, stuff like what you've learned, right? This is an interactive session. I want to hear from you in the chat. And then once we get to the q and I want to get questions around what you've learned and telling me stuff is just as much as I'm telling you stuff. If you're watching this in the future, drop stuff in the comments, in the chat. I'm curious to see what you're thinking. We're also going to talk about, yeah. And so actually let's start with what's one thing you've learned this month. And so in the chat, let me give a four minute space for you to write out what you learned this month. I'll also be there in the chat, hanging out. I'll see you in a second. All right. All right. There are some interesting conversations in the chat. Corporate accounting, troubleshooting, psychology and UX, distraction, attention spans, a lot of good stuff there. Um, and if you're, if it's the first time that you're joining us, the thing that I like to impress is that I'm not the only person that knows stuff or has learned things. We get a lot stronger as technologists when we're able to talk about what we've learned in groups around each other. I've learned some interesting things, just checking things out. Like I'm going to check out more about corporate accounting based on what May said. And May, if you could, I'd love for you to email me some articles or, or some of the things that you found interesting there. Love to, love to grab some of that information. So yeah, working together, we learn a lot more. And then we learning apart and having the opportunity to talk about what we've learned is important for our own growth, which is selfishly why I have these sessions, because I get a chance to talk about some of the things I've learned and what you'll start to see in some of my content moving forward. And I get to learn from you guys. So let's get into it. OKRs, who are they for? Now, the reason why I started looking into OKRs is teams tend to and I've been guilty of this. I've worked around teams that have done this, right? OKRs are the hot thing in the marketplace. People tell you that, do you have OKRs? And people feel like they need to institute OKRs, no matter what type of business they're in. And what I've learned is that's real. OKRs should certainly be used in certain types of businesses. That is where OKRs can be effective. And then if you do not create the environment to where OKRs can succeed, right, it's just going to lead to a bunch of extra work. And extra work leads to frustration. And then the frustrations lead folks to slow movement and we haven't gone anywhere. And so here are a couple of things that I've learned this month. That OKR should be used by empowered teams. When I've talked to folks that have implemented OKRs, I've noticed a trend where teams, and again, I've been guilty of this too, think about OKRs as something that you can just implement and implement everywhere. And it's another method to get people to do what you, you want, right? It's another method of command and control because the way they think is if I give people something on the corporate level, something on the org level, something on the team level, division level, something on the team level, they'll work on all of those things and we'll make progress on all of it. Right? And that's not what OKRs are for. OKRs at its core are alignment mechanisms. They're communication mechanisms to help teams understand what and what to do and what not to do. And they aren't what they aren't a mechanism to tell people what exactly to do, right? They're for empowered teams. So if your team is not allowed to fail or not allowed to choose, you should not be using OKRs. You should, people should be using an alternative method to get what they need across the folks. 
OKR should be leading to less work, not more. It's a focusing mechanism. Back to that example I talked about before where teams are nesting. You're now giving people even more work to do. And as human beings, we have a limited amount of working memory. We have, we can hold up to seven plus or minus two things in our heads at once. This is called Calvin's Law. And when you think about OKRs and how they're broken down, you have an OKR, you have an objective, that's one thing, and probably two to three KRs. That's an additional two to three things. So you, for every OKR, you're asking somebody to keep in working memory three to four things. Not to mention all the other things that they need to keep in working memory to do their jobs. And so when you have these nested OKRs and you're talking about 20, 25 OKRs, how can anybody keep themselves focused on what's important? At best, they're going to be scattered. At worst, they're going to throw their hands up and say, I don't want to do any of it. Let me just do what I know works. And so OKR should be a mechanism where we're giving less work, right? We create room for focus, not for spreading out work that needs to be done. And OKRs require ritual. OKRs are extremely important. Or what's important for OKRs is to keep up to keep up the operations of the OKR. OKRs need work. And so you what you buy with that less, with the less amount of time that you create by creating focus is more amount of time to take care of OKRs, right? You should be, the objective should be creating focus to where you create a couple more hours a week. And a couple of those hours per week have to be dedicated back into OKRs to keep them functional and keep them working. So if you don't have check-ins or health checks with your OKRs, they're not going to work. Here's the implication. OKRs are mostly used wrong. And teams are frustrated naturally because it's the wrong tool for what folks want. We're better off to ask or to think about the structure of your company, your team organization, what's allowed, what isn't, and to think about all the myriad of plenty of other ways in which to get to an objective before you think about OKRs. Because if it's not in the right environment, all it does is add to people's work and they're going to tune them out, which is ultimately what happens in most companies, right? Folks tune them out until it's the last two to three weeks of a quarter, and then they hurry up and wait, right? I call these hurry up and wait OKRs, right? They work until they work on what they think is important for, let's say, eight to nine weeks of the quarter. And then the last two to three weeks is a rush to do the OKRs, right? Which is... A shame because if the OKRs are that important, you've only put a third or a quarter or even an eighth of the amount of time you think you think should be put on the most important things or, right, they're being ignored. Either way, it's a really bad thing because if it, that was the thing that you needed to focus on and you only put a fourth effort towards it, right, you're missing out on the benefits of having that be the objective that teams are working on. And so first, I'd love to see if you if, put a one in the chat, if that was useful to you, and then tell me over the next few minutes, what was useful about it. And if it was useful, tell me why. And also any questions. All right. All right. So next section, back to Miller's law. I mentioned it earlier, and we're going to talk a bit more about Miller's Law and why it's important to product development as a whole. Miller's Law is that the number of objects that the average person can hold in working memory is seven plus or minus two, so nine or five. You don't have an unlimited amount of space. This goes across teams as a product person whether you're working in product management, product design, product engineering. One thing that product prefix adds to your name is the idea that we're working in complex spaces, meaning we're working in spaces that we don't know what the endpoint is. And so because of that, 
there is a tendency or can be a tendency for folks to try to paper ideas to teams and try to paper. And what I mean by papering is try to load up on options for people. When I talked about those OKRs from before, those like nested OKRs, I think that's a symptom of papering. It's a symptom of saying, I don't really trust what's happening around me. And so I'm going to put these mechanisms into play because this will help the team's focus. When in truth, it doesn't help the team's focus. They, as I said, it leads them to either hurry up and wait OKRs, which is right. They're just going to rush through, uh, or they're going to ignore them completely. And then maybe by happenstance, they get achieved. And then in that case, if there's no focus, then again, why did you even make it an OKR? I think that's what's behind Miller's Law. And I think we fail it a lot due to a lack of trust in organizations. Our job as a product person, product designer, product engineer, product manager, product marketer, is to help people and help teams make better decisions consistently. And that said, we need to make sure that the teams are focused on the right things. So what do I want you to leave here with? What's the implication of this practically in the work that we do? Removing something is worth much more than adding anything. Because by removing something, you open up space and working memory. Or if a person's overloaded, which is probably the case, Removing the things that don't matter or don't matter as much or can matter, but isn't the focus of what we do opens up space for other things, right? And it's a question of opportunity cost. And so we should be thinking about removing far more than adding things. I alluded to it before when I said, teams are going to focus on things that are important. There are many things that come up for teams when they're creating things, right? In your day, you have this idea of what you're going to do, but when you wake up and when you get to your computer, things start happening. Something happens here, something happens there, something at home, something in the product that you're working with, something on Slack. Things start taking your time and attention. And these things, are always there, no matter what day. I've never woken up, especially at a job, and have had complete silence. And yet we plan as if we have complete silence. This is compounded by the amount of people we work with. So that level of that, all those little distractions and interruptions happen across the team, right? Everybody has something. Stuff you know about, some stuff you don't. And so as you lead or Again, if you have an, any part of influence, the less you add on to, to, into the team, the better. And in fact, removing as much as you can is better. Because then folks will focus. And on the other side, folks will trust you. Because everybody loves the person that removes what they see as red tape throughout the day. And so... If this was useful, tell me why. If it wasn't useful, tell me why. Hop in the chat and let's talk about it over the next few minutes. And of course, any questions, throw them in there. All right. Fantastic. So if you're new, one thing I try to do at the end of these AMA sessions, I try to get two things that are particularly product focused. And then I try to get one thing that isn't in the world of product. I try to get something that's outside of what you would typically think is product work because it's a good way to get cross-disciplinary. And even outside of tech, right? There are things that other places or other nations have to teach us when it comes to the work that we do. And so for this one, for this month, I'm going to theater, and the reason why I'm going to theater is I spent time directing a play reading this weekend. 
And I learned a bit from doing the rehearsals. Now, in my spare time, I'll direct things because I, I find directing interesting as a way to think through, as a way to take an idea that somebody else has written and then put it on. And I find a lot of analogs with that with product management because it's constant problem solving. It's constant vision realization. And you run the show, right? Unlike products, when you direct, you tend to run the show, right? And so this gave me another way of learning how to make decisions, right? Without consensus, you're the director, you figure things out at the time. And so a couple of things I learned all around the concept of slowing down, it's super helpful uh, to what we do. And then I slowing down, you, you get a chance to do rehearsals. And so the first thing about slowing down around rehearsals is saying things slow. When we, in the rehearsal, it, it was for a drama, right? And the drama was about how parents got over their kid's death, right? How are they, how are they grieving? And so when me and the actors first got together, it was very easy to just say things fast, right? To act, right? But you don't want people to act during rehearsals. Rehearsals are where you get the nastiness out so that when it's time to perform, you're able to go ahead and perform. And so you have control in how you are doing things in rehearsal. And so making the actor say things really slowly and to really find that emotional edge was super useful in helping them understand what the play was about and how they can apply their work to what the playwright was trying to get them to see and get them to feel. I think for us, when we think about our rituals, when we think about, especially if you, let's say you work in a scrum environment, places where you're not showing off, take sprint planning, for example. You can say things slower. You can go slower. You can ask simple questions, right? Because you're trying to get to the, you're trying to think about what the vision is. You're trying to think about what the strategy is. And so bringing things in and slowing things down and not just thinking about the output, but thinking about the overall picture is super useful. Loud works. At one point I had the actors scream their lines. And what ended up happening because they were screaming is they let go of whatever kind of hold they had. And the, the kind of, what I mean by hold is, I mean, there was like an emotional thing holding them back. They were like, they wanted to be proper. And so I just had them yell. And what happened as they were yelling is they got right to the emotional piece, right? They got right to the heart of what was saying because they didn't need to constrain themselves anymore. And sometimes you got to, that's what you got to do. Sometimes you got to be loud. Now, in an office setting, you're not going to scream, but be loud in the work. Have something in hot pink sometimes, right? Be loud in your documentation. Be loud in your presentations. Be loud in your prototypes. Try to get to the core root, the emotion of what people are feeling, because that is really an interesting way of, of pulling things out. Howdy, Derek. And then lastly, you're stretching, right? You own your rehearsal time. When you're thinking about when you're directing, you're pretty much thrown into a room and you got to go work with the actors. And then you got to go create uh, what was happening in the room, what the folks are looking to see. Which means you, you can stretch a bit, right? You don't have to go full out on whatever the output that you're looking to do or full out on the outcome. You can take a second. You can breathe. You can stretch. You can take a walk. You own your rehearsal time and you own your space. So you own your movement within meetings, within collective time. So take advantage of that. And so the implication is what does this mean for you tech folks? Find rehearsal times for the things that are important and then implement those things. Implement saying things slow or doing things slow for a bit till people get locked in to what's happening. 
find rehearsal time, right? And so that you, you can be loud. I'll give you a practical example from my career that was super helpful when we got a chance to be loud. My old boss, Chris Butler, when I worked at this firm called Philosophy, would hold rooms where all the product people would come in and we would bring our whatever asset we had to give to our clients, right? This is a cons consultancy. So we all had different engagements and different clients. And we would go over whatever those facts were, those assets were very loudly, right? We critique them. We'd get, we ask crazy questions. We, we talk about it loudly. So when we left that room, a safe room where we could, in this space, rehearse, we had a far better artifact for the customer. And that, those sessions were extremely important to me in my growth as a product manager. And then lastly, you own your space, stretch. What helps during meetings, and I've learned this in my career too, but like just asking people to breathe. You can tell people to slow down. Hey, everybody, let's take five. Let's get a glass of water. Let's have a break. You don't have to run things all the way through. You don't have to run things high octane all the way through. And right? if people are feeling tired, lean into that. Let folks have a mo moment because when they come back, they'll be better, right? Give people time to stretch. And we're back to the four minutes. Tell me what you thought. And I'll see you then. Ah, before we get into the Q&A, would love to get your feedback. Take your phone, put it to the screen, look at the QR code, and let's take about a minute or two. And then once we get that, we'll be open. Go ahead and give me a one in the chat. Are you ready for, can you fill out the form? You're ready for Q&A. All right, so open Q&A time. If anybody has any questions, we can jump right into it, or is whoever wants to say something, whoever wants to jump in. All right, Megan has a question. What particular experiences with OKRs made you want to talk about it today? The last few weeks, I've been talking with a few teams around OKRs. It's the start of the year, and a lot of teams have this strategy, and now they're using OKRs and ways to try to get focused on the strategy and think about the strategy on a tactical level. And so as I've been talking to companies around OKRs and their new strategies and how they're going to link the two, pushed me back into thinking more and going back into reading about how OKRs worked and how they worked in my career and how I've applied them in my career and how I've used them with teams and what folks have out there to say on the subject. A great resource that I found during this time is there's a podcast, Melissa Perry's podcast. They had Christina Watke, and she was talking about what she had learned. This was an episode dropped in late January, and I got to it in mid-February. She had talked about what she had learned over the last few years working with teams in OKRs, and it sounded very similar to where I have been, where I've been. Felt pretty good about it, dug into more stuff, and, and that created uh, this space here for our AMA. Also creating content for, I'm creating content around it, which should be coming out as soon as I finish editing all of it over the next few weeks content around what I've been learning, what I've been talking about will be on the YouTube channel and on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, I have a TikTok. I never broadcast, I have a TikTok. TikTok is there. Of course, of course. You can type, you can come off of mute, anything top of mind. There have been a couple of people who are talking about the end of OKRs and how we're moving beyond OKRs. I don't know if you've seen anything on that, but it's been trending in the last couple of weeks. I don't know how you feel about that. 
my initial gut reaction is I feel like people have been talking about the end of Agile. And my gut reaction to that is how I look at people who talk about the end of Agile. There are people who have never really used it correctly. And they got to the end and they found a whole bunch of people that are frustrated with it because it's been used incorrectly. And so, yeah, I get it. I get it. I think much like Agile, OKRs have been thrown about. Everybody says you should go use OKRs. And then they give almost zero guidance on how to do it. And it's rare if somebody has read the John Doerr book or if they've read Christina Watke's words on it or have even scanned the past that first Medium article that says, here are OKRs and this is what they do. And then folks run them and then they find failure without knowing that for most teams, right, failure, if you don't know how to run an OKR process, it's probably going to take a year or so for you to learn. It's a long-term commitment. And you got folks to, if you add that with the uh, average tenure for a lot of startups, right? It's a year, 18 months there. Teams generally don't have a connection to OKRs because they don't have people around long enough to actually learn the skill. And then they'll do a whole reset on the product team in two years. And then all of a sudden everything is starting back new. And then everybody that's affected by these OKRs get really frustrated. And you off into the off into the races. It makes sense that there's a backlash with OKRs, but I think it's very similar to the backlash on agile people that have never done it. There's the reaction. I think OKRs are useful. You know, like everything else, there's time and place. Thanks. You're welcome, May. Any other questions? Derek, you're from a different world of tech than everyone else here. Curious what, you... granted, you came in a bit late, but everyone else here <laughs> is on the distributed side. So I'm going to call you out, my dear mainframe friend. What are you thinking? So I, I caught the tail end of it. We use OKRs similar to what you just laid out. We were given it with no guidance. I've got the John Doerr book. I've read a majority of it. We've been trying to figure out still the best way to, to implement it. I, I think we've got it like 25% of the way down the way I've read it, but half of on, on our main friends, side, half of the vision is implemented. The other half we're still trying to figure out. I think everything you just summed up in the last five minutes is what we've been experiencing. Oh, look at that. I've <laughs> Now, you can call your boy here. I can come help y'all as you'd like. But yeah, this is, it's the story for a lot of teams, right? OKRs are almost a victim of what I call conference eats, which is, hey, executives went to a conference or they heard something from a coach. This popular thing in this good company in my network uses OKRs. They love OKRs. It's amazing. It has helped transform our business. They read a couple articles in HBR. They'll say, hey, OKRs transformed our business, and this is how we implemented them. And then they'll read a John Doerr article, and then off into the races. Derek, I would recommend Christina Watke's work. Okay. I'll spell that in the chat. I think she has the best book on OKRs called Radical Focus. And it's a quick read. She talks about it in an applied way through using story, talking about a startup, but I think it's generally the principles that she lays out are generally applicable everywhere. And uh, it's, yeah, it, it's a shame because I think when OKRs are used well, they are amazing especially for teams that are very teams that are very clear and they have the space to operate 
right? They're an empowered team. They're allowed to make their choices and make their decisions. And it's not getting mixed up with high, what is it? Marty K going to call this high integrity commitments or things that folks have to do, right? OKRs are separate from that. And so as long as you're not, like people try to mix and get their own pet projects into OKRs or a KR will be, we ship this, right? It'll be binary. It won't really help with the, with the objective. You have objectives that are just not even possible based on, I don't even know where they come from. They're not connected to any strategy. They're not connected to any vision of where things are or things that are impossible to measure. OKRs are here to focus the team and they should result in them doing less work, not more. And if they are, and if they are doing more work based on OKRs, then there is a problem. But something has to get sorted. So the OKRs allow teams to research, to work on their own, and to free themselves up to think about things that you can't see on a leadership level that they can see that contribute to that objective. And so that's the power of it. If you don't do that, then you're out. You're off into the races. Awesome. I'm shaking my head. Yes, thank you. Uh, you're very welcome, Mr. Poe. Uh, my services are hire me <laughs> to come by and help run some workshops and get folks all back online with with OKRs that is available. It's an option. More than happy to get folks and do that. The beautiful thing about OKRs is because folks tend to ignore most of them, there's a space for you to take whatever your section of the world is and cut them off from the what's trying to be done on the corporate level and try to master the art of the OKR. And you got to pirate it a bit because everybody else's OKRs are going to be in disarray anyway. You sit in a leadership meeting and then they call on you and your organization or you're part of the organization. What's your OKR status? 25%. Oh my God. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything to anybody in the room, but they just know the number. So you can game it a bit. But then you can use that space to figure out how to actually do it and do it in a good way. And again, it's a, it takes time, right? You need, a, you need about a year. Year some change, right? Um, May, me and May, <laughs> we got to know each other based on I would say somewhat similar experiences over the last few years in, in leadership positions where I'm sure, I'm sure she, <laughs> I mean, Derek, I'm sure you too, right? When, you, when they do the OKR call out on percentages, and they walk around the room that I'm assuming that's very familiar. Fudge the numbers so we don't yell that. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh the numbers oh. always get fudged. Oh, we're at 75%. What an amazing thing. What does the 75% mean? I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody cares except the number, right? Is it green? Which is dangerous all in its own, on its own. So yeah, you can cut away and like actually use your organization to learn how to do this and give them the bullshit numbers until you, because when it works, when you have the things in place for it to work in the focus, right? It's a beautiful thing. All right. If that is it, I want to thank you all for joining. Jim has a question. Or... Oh, oh, May. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you, May. At what point should businesses con consider changing their OKRs? Oh, you should be changing your OKRs in the moment. And in a really good organization, you quit OKRs that don't serve you. But in most organizations, your OKRs should be a quarter even if you can't quit them, at max, they should be a quarter. When you're really good at OKRs, you'll find out this doesn't work. It doesn't serve us. Well, let's... I was, uh, when I was a smart recruiter, so I was the king of killing OKR. Because I would just, yeah, this, we're not doing this. We're not going to be able to make it. It's silly. That's right, man. <laughs> it's silly. Like, we might as well not lie to ourselves. Let me open my team up for the other work that they can do that's useful to the organization and not bother them with nonsense. At the max, your OKR should extend to a quarter and no longer, no longer. You should be changing them quarterly. And 
if you're asking teams to do work that extends longer than that, at max, I was like, and you would have to submit, if I was the person in charge of OKRs, I would have to have it submitted in writing why you would need a half a year, but that is really not the case, right? Anything that extends past a quarter, OKRs is the wrong time scale for you to think about that. You're thinking about strategy at that point, right? Because as you get further and further out, and we're talking about these complex things that we're working on, there is room for error, right? There's more and more noise in the system the further we go out. And so the tools that we create for goals and objectives have to have a certain amount of time scale or a certain amount of optionality, right? The further it goes out, the more optionality it has to have. OKR is not that much optionality. Quarter, that's it. Strategy, a bit of optionality, right? You can, you need to have bets and you need to have alternate routes set up. Scenario planning with strategy. And then out to like vision and mission, right? A ton of optionality, right? So much optionality that a good mission statement is what a sentence that doesn't tell you anything except really what the direction of the company is because it has a ton of optionality, right? We, we need folks to be able to make changes on the ground. Oh, wow, it's one o'clock. I, I got to drop, but yeah, that's it. Thank you for asking that question because I, I need to, yeah, I need to talk about that more. And yeah. Everybody have a good month. We'll do this next month and talk to you all soon. Bye.